Hi, and welcome to MentorCore. If you're new here, we're a community focused on helping people in the security, risk, and compliance fields grow their careers and leadership skills through mentoring. You can find more information about MentorCore at mentorcore.biz. I'm Dan Ayala, along with Lisa Beth Lentini Walker. Now, on to this week's discussion. Welcome to another MentorCore podcast. Today, we have an outstanding guest that I am just so excited about. Tammy actually is a friend of mine from back in the day, um, but Tammy Dawkin is in charge of being the chief data privacy officer at the World Bank. What a cool job. Um, but she has done so much throughout her career um, as a, an attorney, as a privacy professional. She's worked with global brands, and she is joining us today to tell us about her career and some of the exciting things that are coming up uh, at the World Bank and in privacy in general. So let me not steal any thunder here. Tammy, thank you for joining us. Tell us a little bit about you and about what your career has been like that has brought you to this very moment. Sure. Thanks, Lisa Beth. Thanks for the invitation uh, to you and Dan. It's great to be here. Um, gosh, my journey. Uh, it's been it's been a fascinating, great journey. Um, I right out of law school, I uh, went to work for one of the larger law firms in my hometown of Minneapolis. Um, I was a corporate lawyer, corporate transactional. So I was involved in mergers and acquisitions and corporate compliance um, and standard run of the mill uh, corporate transactions. Um, I started to work closely with one of my clients, um, a global hospitality chain, uh, which is where I met Lisa Beth. Um, I uh, did continue to do uh, general corporate work. Um, I also was in charge of marketing and uh, strategic sourcing and um, that was going really well. I loved the company. Um, one day, my boss, the general counsel, um, we were in a, a team meeting of his, his direct report meeting. And as we were all getting up to, to leave the room, he said, oh, oh, we've got this issue um, with the Polish data protection regulator. Uh, I guess they're gonna make a final judgment um, against us in a couple of weeks. Anybody wanna take this on? And you could hear the crickets chirping and You're I raised my hand. You're the one that didn't step back, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one who's, I, I leaned in. I said, yeah, I don't know anything about data privacy or data protection, certainly not in Poland, but um, sure, I'll take it. So I did my homework, I met with the regulator, I prepared my, my argument, and uh, we, got the, uh, we got the allegation dismissed, saving the company hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is back in 2013 or 14. Um, and I was hooked. I thought, oh my gosh, this is my next, uh, this is the direction my uh, career is going to take. So I started really diving into data privacy. I became uh, certified through the International Association of Privacy Professionals. Um, and that was, that was just how I uh, segued into privacy. I was recruited uh, to join MoneyGram International, which is a financial services uh, corporation um, with operations in 200 countries. Um, they recruited me to be their first chief privacy officer. And this was right before the general data protection regulation was going live. And so I had the uh, opportunity to build a privacy program at MoneyGram from scratch in response to uh, the compliance issues that uh, they were going to face with GDPR coming into effect. Uh, fun challenge, great company that 
uh, I got to move to Dallas, uh, where uh, MoneyGram is headquartered, um, and it was going really, really well. And one day I answered one of the um, recruiting emails that I would get periodically, and I never responded to any of them. This one I did. I opened up and um, had a conversation, and um, that led to the World Bank recruiting me away from MoneyGram to set up its first uh, privacy program and privacy office. Um, so I can tell you more about the World Bank, um, but that's kind of my career journey along the way. I, I had three children, uh, went from Minneapolis to Dallas to DC, um, and that's where I am now, three and a half years into uh, my time at the World Bank. Very, very neat. Um, question for you. In 2013, when you started in down the privacy route, did you have any sense that privacy was going to actually take the stronghold, the foothold that it has here in 2022 and the directionality mm -hmm. of it? Or I guess, did you really believe that that was going to happen? I know at the time I didn't. Oh, yeah, I, <laughs> I didn't. Um, again, you know, my introduction was this esoteric single question in, you know, a foreign country. Um, so I really didn't, but something in my gut just said, you know, keep pursuing this, even if you don't practice law in this area, even if you don't, you know, become a privacy officer, just, I, I was just curious. So I, um, but I never could have and, and didn't envision that this is the, how, how the world would go. Um, and in fact, one of my, um, one of my mentors kind of scoffed at me and he, he was like, oh, you know, you're just wasting your time. And, you know, what are you doing? And, and I was like, no, I, I'm interested in this. I want to keep doing this. And Lisa Beth knows who I'm speaking of. Um, uh, uh, former general counsel of Carlson Group. Um, so I just kept going. And yeah, and now sky's the limit. Because, you know, now we're looking at data privacy issues and artificial intelligence and drone images and using personal data to uh, to affect and influence our cultures and how people act. So it's fascinating. So um, I'm curious because I am often curious. Um, one of the things that I know our listeners regularly are interested in hearing more about is when you have a mentor and they give you advice that you feel in your gut is not aligned to where you want to be or what you see as the future of your career. How do you handle that tactfully? And is that someone who necessarily remains a mentor or do you decide that you're going to go in a different direction because maybe you're not aligned at that point? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I, I view mentorship as a sounding board, as somebody who can provide, share their experience with, um, with the younger generation and, you know, just provide insight. And <clears throat> I think but, but I would never just, you know, take that advice and go, oh, I can't do that then. You know, it's not that my mentors don't direct how I, how I handle things, but, and, and this gets easier, I think, the more mature you get in your career where you can, you know when to say, oh, hmm, that's an interesting observation, but I think you're out of touch on this one. And, um, so yes, he still is my mentor. Um, it, and it also depends on the kind of relationship you have. You know, we joke all the time and he gives me a hard time and I give him a hard time. And so, you know, it depends on, on that, um, that communication style that you have with a mentor. And then, you know, I had another mentor when I was at my law firm and I had just had my third child and wanted to go part time, which, you know, is very difficult at a law firm. And so I was going to step step away. And he sat down and wrote, I think it was eight handwritten pages of things for me to consider. 
and you know he wanted me to stay but he wanted to provide you know here are things to think through and think think about both short term and long term and that was phenomenal guidance um and then later on you know he gave me some different uh thoughts and i thought again yeah maybe but i think i think i'm going to do this a little bit differently I, I love how you um, contextualize that. And I always think that mentors are there to provide perspectives. They don't, you don't have to agree with them all the time. The beauty is that we don't agree because we see things differently. Mm -hmm. So as long as you can take that and look at multiple different perspectives, it informs your decision making in perhaps a different way than it would if you just did it alone in a vacuum without those other perspectives to think about. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I think it's important to have mentors um, of different generations, but also of your, sa your sa same generation, because um, three of the mentors who I have had throughout my career are all a different generation and I value their experience and their, you know, their outlook and their ability to, you know, recall what's happened historically and predict, you know, how things might go. But on the same hand, they were of a different generation and I know that the generation behind me sees things completely differently you know they're digital natives they're you know living in you know now a covid world where you know they're going to school and and it, so it i think it's really rich when you get you know all of those perspectives and can then make make your own decisions with confidence and um and pivot if it turns out to be a bad decision I don't think that there are ever truly bad decisions in most things in life. Um, there are just learning moments. <laughs> agree, agree. As my team and I call them opportunities, there's an opportunity here to add value or do things differently. So speaking of doing things differently, I'm not a lawyer. I am in privacy. I am, you are a lawyer and you are in privacy. Um, I'm really curious, this is a question I get asked a lot, we, we talk about it in the compliance space a lot, but in privacy, I think it's equally as important. Do I need to be a lawyer to be effective in a privacy role? Oh, great question. Um, no, you don't. Um, I think it helps. Um, I really think I've seen peers in the privacy sphere struggle more without a law degree um so i really and and i'm a fan of education and continuing to grow and learn and so i would encourage anybody on the fence you know if they can afford it and work it into their their schedule um i would say try to get a get a law degree um but it's definitely not required um and in fact at the World Bank to pull it back to my current circumstances, um, it's really, you know, really not necessary because we don't comply with any laws around the world. We are completely self-governed um, because of how we're structured as a as a treaty organization. Um, so the the thinking, the critical thinking that you learn in law school, and the ability to analyze. Um, I think that training is invaluable, but I would I would hire somebody on my team without a law degree as long as they could demonstrate those skills in a different way. So um, no, you don't have to, but strongly encourage uh, to ease your path and just train your brain. Yeah, my experience is jive with that. It's it, the fact that um, I've basically taken on much of that kind of experience, or I've acquired that experience over the time doing it. I haven't got yeah. the official JD, but all of those things have been hugely yeah. helpful yeah. Uh, in doing it because privacy is so law focused. But Dan, you have a technology background, mm -hmm. which is the other, you know, the other piece to this. So I think success, people who are successful in the privacy sphere, you know, 
have a, a JD or they have technical experience or ideally both. I am not a technical person, so I am completely reliant on the tech side of the bank and you know wherever I, I work. I, I wish I had that. Um, so you know that's equally as important and can uh, can really help a, a career in this space as well. I would venture to add in that, you know, what I'm seeing more and more in all of these professions, whether it's legal, compliance, privacy, security, audit, like pick, pick your profession, all of the people who are um, never thanked enough and handle all of the, 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 uh, the, the frameworks and back of the house to make life seem smooth. We all need to be somewhat conversant. Mm -hmm in multiple different areas to be effective because we need to learn those different languages and connect with people. That Absolutely. might even be a resounding support for a liberal arts education. <laughs> <laughs> there love might it. be a little bit there. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. So, so let's take a little bit of a different tack. Um, there are some things going on that you are doing with um, the World Bank Privacy Program uh, in the next uh, coming weeks and months as you gear up to um, privacy days. So tell us a little bit of more about what you're doing that's special, what's available out there that, that sure. people could, could see and understand and maybe participate in. Absolutely. Uh, Lisa Beth, thanks for Thanks for asking about that. Um, so listeners may already know um, that January 28th is International Data Privacy Day. Uh, why January 28th? That was when Convention 108 was signed that um, started the whole privacy conversation. Um, so January 28th, um, many companies have you know, events to recognize this day. Um, at the world, so my former, my first uh, role as chief chief privacy officer, um, for example, I handed out privacy stickers and you know privacy you know trinkets and things, and uh, that's how we recognized the day. Um, at the World Bank, we're doing things much bigger. Um, so starting with uh, my first year there in. Uh, 2020. I started in 2019, but in 2020, Data Privacy Day, um, we we had a full day of events. Um, we brought in uh, creative uh, people. We brought in a cast of a play on data privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, the play was called The Right to Be Forgotten, and so we had this dramatic um, uh, demonstration of, you know, what we're talking about when we talk about misusing uh, personal data. Um, we had uh, FT, the FTC chairman speak, we had uh, data, pro data protection regulators, you name it, we had it. Um, and then the next year, uh, of course, we had to, you know, do something as great um, or, or better. And so same thing, we had round tables, we had, um, you know, the data protection commissioners from the UK, we had Helen Dixon from Ireland, we had uh, John Edwards from New Zealand, and again, another full day of events, um, capped off by, um, again, trying to reach people through different methods of communicating. Um, so that year we ended the day with a spoken word performance by a man named Brandon Leak. Um, and Brandon had won America's Got Talent that year. And so he did, um, he, he provided this performance and recited three of his works all of which tie back to racism and data privacy or misusing personal data. Um, so resounding success. And this was during the, um, the George Floyd protests and the really heightened racial discussions. Um, and then last year we had, again, the same thing, although we precluded the day by having a, a full day um, uh, seminar with Professor Daniel Solov from George Washington Law School. Um, he provided this 
wonderful learning event for just for staff. Um, and then on Data Privacy Day, again, the same thing. We had these rich speakers and discussions and engagements and fireside chats um, with all of with many well known um, in the field. And last year we ended with a um, a conversation with Shalini Kantaya. She is a documentarian and has a, um, a film on Netflix right now uh, called Coded Bias. And fabulous, fabulous film. Um, so we, uh, I had a fireside chat with her and uh, she showed clips of the film and we were uh, very, very pleased to have her in. All right, Tammy, that's, a, that's great. But So what have you got on tap for 2023? Oh, we have equally great plans for January 28th, 2023. Um, we're still in, uh, in discussions with many of the speakers and finalizing uh, the exact events for the day, um, but uh, we will, um, it will definitely meet or exceed the previous years. Um, I, I should also mention that we are also very creative. Um, when the when we were all working from home, we had um, we had virtual spaces where people could hang out. We had um, all kinds of interactive activities and um, really, really cool things. So uh, my team is working on on this as we speak. They start. Uh, basically the end of the summer, they start planning um, for the events in January. So many of the events are open to the public um, and this year it will be in person. Um, so I will, uh, I will happily share and invite Dan and Lisa Beth and anybody else who's interested um, to come to DC and see what we've got going on. Uh, we're, we, my team really does a great job and I'm very, very proud of, of what we produce and, um, and welcome all of you. Well, you've um, successfully done, if, you, if your privacy career doesn't work out, your marketing career will be outstanding because <laughs> boy, you've sold it. You've actually convinced me to want to come to DC at the end of January. And that doesn't happen a lot. No, 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 but <laughs> that's wonderful. Good. Although yeah. I do have one question. At, when the play was over that you did, mm -hmm. um, did anybody remember that they had attended it or had they had the actors all been successfully forgotten? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And on that note, <laughs> I can hear the crickets of the audience. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, on that note, unfortunately, we're, we're to the end of our time for today. Um, so I want to ask you, with the question we close every episode with, and that's, tell me about the best advice you've ever received from a mentor. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so I've spoken about some of the guidance that I've gotten and advice. I think, I think I'm going to go back to, this wasn't directly. No reuse. No, reuse. no, no reuse. But I, I'm going to go back to law school. Um, and this wasn't direct guidance or mentoring, but this professor did end up being one of the three mentors that I that I've referenced. And I walked into my first day of corporate law. And remember, I later went on to become a corporate lawyer, but that day, clueless, you know, didn't have any idea what to expect. And my professor walked into the classroom. And th this is pre-computers, if you can imagine. Um, but he walked into the classroom and he didn't say a word and we're all you know, very nervous. And he, the first thing he did was to show us a Bugs Bunny cartoon. And that is how he introduced the concept of agency. And I, that has stayed with me. I just think that's brilliant. And, that ability to share information in many different formats. So you see that in our data privacy day, as I as I mentioned, we have roundtables, we have master classes, we have you know all of the usual, but not everybody absorbs information in the same way. So I think the lesson that I took from that and have used throughout my career is 
you know, look for ways to really connect and make, make what you're trying to say relevant to your audience. And it doesn't always have to be a lecture or read this book. It can be many other things. That's some wise words in an era in which many people are overwhelmed by particular vehicles or we rely too much on one. Um, that's really wise. And uh, I think that everybody can apply that beyond the privacy field, beyond the law, in every way that we communicate. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of communicate, we want to communicate our thanks to you, Tammy. Tammy, for being here. Tammy Dawkin, Chief Data Privacy Officer uh, for the World Bank. Uh, thank you so much. Just amazing insights. And uh, I'm I'm in awe of the program you've built. Uh, and uh, there's a very, very good chance you'll see me in the district on uh, uh, in late January. Excellent. Thank and you, Dan. You, thank you, Lisa Beth. Thank you. And thank you to the listener. We're really, uh, we're really glad you're here and glad you're part of this every week, but we really love your feedback too. So please give us a, drop us an email, info at mentorcore.biz. Uh, you can come to our website, mentorcore.biz for all of this, for this episode uh, and all of our past episodes. You can also find uh, every episode of our podcast uh, by searching your favorite podcast app for MentorCore uh, or searching on YouTube for MentorCore. Uh, we'll be back again soon with another episode of MentorCore.